Welcome back everybody. We appreciate your guys' patience as we've prepared here to have the panel with all the speakers. And so as we've been encouraging you guys, keep the questions coming in. We will do our best to answer them, right you guys? You guys have to nod when I'm, I'm the host here. You listen to my commands, okay? See, they will answer them fittingly. If I didn't like their answer, they're gonna get off the panel. But, so make sure you guys bring the questions in. We so appreciate the ones that are coming in. So right now, you guys, what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump right in, and then right at the end, we're gonna show a video uh, regarding is America a racist uh, nation? And it was brought to you by and published by the Colson Center. Okay, so panel, first off, great job, all three of you guys. I think that you guys complement each other very well. And so that was, uh, I'm sure, very encouraging for our audience. So here's the first question, and we'll start with you, Lucas. The Founding Fathers, many of them were Christian, right? They also supported and perpetuated slavery, segregation, Jim Crow laws, if you will, obviously that, that didn't exist per se, not till later, and also issues regarding social injustice. So how do we teach the gospel and social justice in the church? You know, I think first off, what we have to see is that America was the nation that really put a stop to these practices within the world. You know, we are, uh, although these, you know, you look back throughout history, slavery and injustices have existed for, you know, for a very long time. But what we saw within, uh, and I think our founders, you know, uh, arguably made some mistakes and not, um, uh, they, they chose unification of the states over dealing with individual issues like slavery. And I'm sure that probably some of those things, as time went on, showed themselves to be mistakes. But to, to, to really discount the founders or the Judeo-Christian framework of our nation, I think is a very, uh, I think it's a, it, it's, it's, a, it's a falsity. It's a mistake that a lot of people have made. Within the church, you know, I get asked all the time, are there the redemptive aspects to, to CRT? And I think the answer is no. The, because anything that, if there's any commonality that CRT just happens to hit on that happens to be true, it's not true because CRT holds it. It's true because it's true in God's word. God's word is the path for justice. It is the path for racial reconciliation. It is the path for truth and equality and all of these things. And I think that that has to be our priority. Janique, what, what say you to that question about the founding fathers and social justice in the church? Um, I agree completely with what Lucas said. I guess I would only add that what we do see with the founding fathers are real human beings that struggled with sin, as do we. Yeah. In addition to that, even though they struggled with the sin of slavery, I do find it very interesting that Thomas Jefferson, as one of the framers of the Declaration of Independence, still acknowledged what was the right thing to do, that all men are created equal and they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. So I find that it's very interesting, even though he was doing something wrong, he still acknowledged what the right thing to do is. And it's because of him acknowledging that truth that we have one of the greatest documents ever written. And so the other aspect of that, that I would even think of, even as the church is re remembering that we do not throw people away simply because they have sin in their life. I mean, God doesn't do that. Yeah. In fact, when we actually think about God, we think of a redeemer who reconciles us unto him. And so even though, and again, America is not perfect. We are exceptional because of our values and because we have a republic which is governed by God. Well, was, you know, I mean, ultimately that's what a republic is. Now it's sad that we're trying to take God out of that, but ultimately that's what a republic is. It's not a theocracy. But no. through the republic of democracy, mm -hmm. right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that's, a, that's something wonderful and that's something beautiful. I think that is something that we should hold on to. And I think it's something to teach. I don't think we need to run away from history. I think it's important to teach all of that. Yeah, and that's well said. And plus, what people need to understand too, when it comes to Tom, uh, Thomas Jefferson, he wanted to address more of the issues with slavery, but he got voted down. So it wasn't like he was, you know, hijacking it, you know, just in, in, a, in a way that was white supremacy, as some people say. Dr. Jeff, how would you respond as well as to what Lucas and Janique had said regarding the Founding Fathers? When the Founding Fathers put together the Declaration of Independence and later the Constitution, they weren't putting those into play saying this is the way things are. They were saying this is the way we think things should be based on a biblical view of the world. Right. So, it, and we can all experience that in our own personal lives. This is the man I know I should be. I'm not that man, but I aspire to that. Yeah. And I, I work toward that. I want to be a better man. And nations do the same thing. They want to be better nations. 
I, I do disagree with the 1619 project that says that America was uh, founded to promote slavery, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, slavery was not under attack by Great Britain, and this was an issue with the nation of Great Britain. The Declaration of Independence makes that very clear. The founders, in addition, that's interesting, even though many, many of them owned slaves, about 2% of the people in the United States of America at America's founding were slaves, they did not defend slavery as a social good. They recognized that this is an institution that we're ashamed of and that we think that ultimately will, will go away. But they were trying to put into place, and this is the first time in, in all of human history that this happened. You pointed this out, Luke, it's a very good point. First time in all of human history that these principles were put down to, to, to bring about the kind of society in which slavery could be abolished. As Martin Luther King put it, the arc of, of history is long, but it bends toward justice. Yeah. Well said, appreciate that, you guys. Here's the next question. What are some basic kingdom values, Janique, that we can use to model or teach the young generation to help them discern the lies of CRT? So going along the lines of what you talked about earlier about how it's being not just infiltrated into the churches, but also how it's being taught in our schools. How can we teach some values for our kids to discern what's taking place in our schools? Sure, I, I would say the first thing is that we need to train the next generation to look for objective truth. I believe that one of the issues in our society today is a drifting away. I don't think most people even understand what objective truth is. They tend to only focus on that which is subjective. And part of that is because of postmodernism. But I do think it's important that they understand that there is a such thing as objective truth. There is also that which corresponds to reality. And when we're dealing with situations, we do need to ask questions and be in pursuit of facts that we do not just jump because there is a story or because we even see something on social media or even the news, the, the, the media, oftentimes they will play a certain narrative. And if we're not wise, if we're not patient to say, you know what, I don't have all of the facts. I need to pursue the facts. And that means by asking questions. That's part of what apologetics deals with is, is the art of also asking questions as well as giving a logical reason defense for what it is that you believe. But I do think we need to train the next generation to do that. Secondly, it's how do we look at our neighbor? Do we look at our neighbor where we're judging them on the outward appearance? First Samuel 16, 7, remember when he said, listen, God looks at the what heart man looks at the outward appearance but the lord looks at the heart are we looking at our brothers and sisters only through the melanin in their skin and not just are we looking at them that way are we automatically assuming the worst about them whatever happened to the benefit of the doubt and giving someone the best and allowing allowing each individual to show me who they actually are rather than let me just assume the worst about an individual. Now, the last thing I will say this, and I don't wanna take up a lot of time, the reason that I think this is critically important with CRT is we're either going to create people who are permanent victims. I did not grow up in the United States. I never, the entire time our family still talks about this, the entire time that we grew up in Europe, we never once thought about the color of our skin as being problematic because it wasn't. In the United States, people tend to think of their skin as a problem. But that's in the United States. We need to train this next generation that sin is a heart issue. It's not, when we deal with racism, that's a sin issue, it's not a skin issue. And so I really think it's incumbent upon us to train the next generation to look at what is true to look at how we also look at one another, but also what does it mean to love our neighbor? And it's not judging them incorrectly because scripture tells us, John 7, 24, that we are to judge rightly. Yeah, amen. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not gonna give you, Lucas, or Jeff an opportunity because I think Janique just kind of stole the she floor. So yeah, you just, you just, we just nodded, <laughs> like, good job, Janique. We appreciate that. So Jeff, here's a great question along the lines, it's coming from a Christian student at college. She says, I'm a, I'm a student at a Christian college and I encounter CRT in my English class. I did my best, best to ask questions and approach my English professor, but she didn't believe she was teaching CRT. So here's the question. What is the next step in a situation where someone doesn't believe they are buying into CRT? Mm -hmm. I think this is a worldview issue. When you, when you look at the color of somebody's skin as the measure of their worth, you've automatically taken on a materialist view. 
materialist view as the, it, it was the view held by Karl Marx and lots of other people in history that only the material world exists. That is, that's an example of what this student can do. You want to identify what are the, what are the core worldview issues, what are the things that must be true for the teacher's approach to be valid. I, I'm really disturbed on university campuses when students learn about critical theory of, of any kind. Now, when I was at a Christian university, we studied it. I was, we were the first, Derek Bell's book would just come out. We were the first class to read it. We were studying all of these things, but we were trying to understand how these worldviews interacted together. And it was, a, there's a big difference mm -hmm. between doing that and some kind of an indoctrination that says, this theory, is, this theory is so true that there are no examples that can refute it. And if anything, if anything is thought to refute it, that just proves that it's true. This is not scholarship. This is indoctrination. And I would continue to, I just, what I think the student can do is just identify what would you say are some of the key characteristics of a biblical worldview, the things that are true, if scripture is true, and then what are the key characteristics if critical race theory as a religious worldview of sorts is true, and then start to compare those and engage the teacher in that dialogue. Yeah, it's well said. I appreciate that, uh, Jeff. Lucas, a question for you from one of our audience members, Julian Turner asks, why, why is current social justice primarily about BLM and LGBTQ plus issues while ignoring what most would consider human atrocities such as human trafficking and exploitation of minors? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think that, look, you know, social justice is really code today for either the social gospel, which was an early 1900s idea of progressive Christianity, or the more modern you know, counterpart to that is progressive Christianity today, which has a bent towards this CRT uh, sort of worldview. And so I, I think that um, it's interesting. There, it seems to be very selective with the issues that they, uh, uh, that they, that they take up as a cause. Um, I know a friend of mine, uh, uh, Kevin McGarry with uh, Every Black Life Matters, you know, just uh, um, it just does brilliant work. And you know, one of the things that he'll talk to people, and he's you know, he's he's a large black man. He's a black belt in karate. I mean, he's he's on my top ten list of guys not to get in a fight with. You know, uh, but he's just such a brilliant thinker. And and he'll say, you know, he'll go up to somebody at the at, he'll go to a BLM meeting and say, do you believe that every black life matters? And they'll go yes. And then he'll start talking to them about abortion. And you know, and it, it's so powerful. I think especially coming from him because it's unexpected. And, and, and I think that you know, um, the inconsistencies give um, a, a, a glimpse of where fallacy lies. You know, within Christianity, uh, inequality in any form should be something that is of interest to us. We are, we are against inequality of any kind. Uh, we are against injustice of any kind. We want to see it, but we don't want to bring a human worldview to that. We want to take those ideas and really, you know, make them, you know, really captive to Christ in that sense to bring a Christian viewpoint to that. And I think that those inconsistencies really uh, show the cards of a lot of the, the, the falsities that exist. Because a lot of times we are seeing is attacking to identify the people who are oppressing yes. and try to oppress them and saying that's yeah. justice. And that's one of the things you guys have been talking about where that, is an, that in itself can be an injustice not just an inconsistency. Um, Janique, because of your background, because somebody was talking about exploitation, is there anything else you wanna add in regards to that when you look at proponents of CRT, how they wanna address you know, the color of their skin, right? Um, versus what, how they're ignoring the exploitation of minors? and human trafficking, for example? Sure, um, well, the only other thing I would say about that is I think we have to remember that part of the whole agenda that we see with critical race theory and even with the social justice movement is linguistic theft, where at one point a word meant something, it meant one thing, now it means something totally different. At one point, the social justice movement, they were actually talking about human trafficking. Not anymore. Because it has changed and it's shifted, now it has a completely different ideology and worldview. So I think that that's actually critically important. That And that's part of the reason why a lot of people do not think that they're teaching critical race theory is because they're using some of the euphemisms that I brought up. They're using other words, and that's part of that whole linguistic theft where let's take words that sound good. I mean, who doesn't agree with justice, right? 
Who doesn't want justice? I mean, that sounds great, but they use a positive word, but it actually has a negative connotation when you actually look at what it is that they're trying to achieve. We also see that word justice hijacked with reproductive justice. Well, how can you tell me that the intentional killing of an innocent human being is actually justice? That's injustice. That's reproductive injustice. But that's not how they word it. So that's part of it is how people like to hijack language, and that's that linguistic theft, and use it for what they want to do. And, the and to your point, and the amazing thing is, going back to some of these polls, Jeff, that we've even seen here at Summit, is they even evaluated women who've had abortions and said they're not actually liberated. So they're not actually freeing them to be free to do whatever they did, you know, or f why they had an abortion so they could be free to do whatever. They're not really being liberated. So that there's these false narratives that we're seeing. Jeff, here's another question from Anna uh, Floyd. If CRT proponents want equality of outcomes, how could neo-segregation possibly produce that? Hmm. <laughs> 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 I, I have to try to put myself in the mindset of somebody who, who's yeah. advocating this. Keep in mind, and I don't mean to just continue harping on this, but it's important. These are materialistic worldviews. They believe that only the material world exists. There's a fixed pie and the best we can do is divide it up into smaller and smaller pieces to make sure nobody gets a bigger piece than anybody else. That's right. The biblical worldview, worldview of abundance, says make more pies. There's not a fixed amount of justice. There is not a fixed amount of, of ingenuity, ideas, inspiration, all of these kinds of things, these immaterial values, liberty, these are not in a fixed quantity. So when somebody says there's only so much to go around, they're automatically betraying their, their worldview and trying to limit all of the possible solutions to just that. Yeah. So the neo-segregationist is saying the pie is there, there's only so much, and some of the pieces are bigger than others. So we can use segregation to help divide the pie up into smaller pieces. Mm. You should just reject that premise outright. Oh, very good. Right, so hopefully that, that uh, answers your question there. I think it was uh, Ms. Floyd. All right, so the last question um, that I want to ask you, Lucas, okay, your book on the Christian left, and you mentioned some of your talk on progressive you know, Christianity and kind of the historical Jesus, and you went to Albert Schweitzer and kind of the classic things and how that's being not just, so CRT is not just being infiltrated in the church, but a lot of times just even just through progressive Christianity, their views of Jesus and atonement, imputation, Marcus Borg kind of stuff. Can you help our audience understand the distinction between the Christian left to some extent and progressive Christians, but why on both camps are they teaching CRT in the church? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that every camp knows that they're teaching CRT. I think there's some that are just grabbing hold of talking points. Uh, if you go back, and I'll, I'm gonna resist naming names here, but if you go back to um, right after the George Floyd uh, um, you know, death, when, if you just look at pastor's Instagrams, you know, how many of them were putting the black square on Instagram, right? I don't think that all of them were going, I'm introducing CRT in my church. They felt pressure. They had people asking them questions. Do you believe Black Lives Matter or not? And they were trying to demonstrate some sort of, I stand against, you know, injustice and inequality. Uh, and and they, they, a lot of them, I think, were just pressured into responding without even being able to think through it. Um, uh, Ibram Kendi were, was probably not a name that they knew. They weren't reading Robin D'Angelo. They were just caught off guard. Now, since that time period, we've seen people either kind of wake up and realize like, hey, there's, there's some other stuff going on here that really goes out, outside of a biblical worldview or biblical orthodoxy. And there's others that are saying they're doubling down on it. And we're seeing, you know, uh, I, I own a film production company. I've, I've done, you know, films for, you know, major networks as well as kind of my work as a pastor. And I can tell you that that these progressive notions have worked themselves through even within Christian media. Um, and, and look, there's a lot of great people out there and a lot of really good Christian media out there, but there are some that have really become hijacked by this ideology, people that were solid five, ten years ago that today have drifted, and, and I think that we have to be aware. And so um, there is a spectrum. There is certainly, uh, um, uh, you know, but, but, but I think that what we're seeing loudest right now is this doubling down on critical race theory. And again, not all of them will use the term critical race theory, but I think to that we go, okay, are you teaching that racism is permanent? Are you teaching that, you know, systemic racism? And so let's, let's forget the, the term right now of CRT 
Let's talk about the beliefs, and if what somebody is proclaiming lines up with those things, this is an idea that's outside of a biblical worldview, and it should be rejected by Christians. Well, I appreciate your guys' feedback on these, and hopefully to the audience, this has really helped you guys you know, understand as you grapple some of the complication of CRT and how it's being taught like you, with these euphemisms, and hopefully that has brought some clarity.